Hello, students. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. However, or whenever time you're listening to this, we are going to be taking our next conversation, our next lecture into obtrusive methods. So let's just jump into it, shall we? In this lecture, we will cover a few different types of unobtrusive research in addition to secondary analysis that we discussed in the previous chapter or previous lecture. Now, unobtrusive research is a method of studying social behavior without being involved or impacting it, right? So pulling this next slide here, we have the different types here, or as we just said, being, in, being involved or impacting it. That is, we do not directly contact participants through this research. We can use statistics already provided by another source. We can use content analysis where we code content that has been recorded and we can use historical comparative analysis where we analyze historical records. Now, unobtrusive me measures can be qualitative or quantitative, depending on if we are looking for numbers or in-depth information. Now, when we analyze existing statistics, this is where we are using someone else's analysis of data, right? Such as city fact sheets and that we can find on the US Census website or specific communications. The numbers already analyzed are simply using results. That is different than this, that is different than secondary analysis or data analysis where we get the raw data and run our own statistics. Now, this is often helpful as a supplementary source of data or to get some background information for our research. Now, of course, a weakness that is, we need to be able to rely on statistics. So having them come from reputable sources with primary researchers taking all the steps to report them correctly is necessary if we are going to try to answer our research question with existing statistics as our main source of data. Now we could get into similar situations with our secondary data analysis where our research questions can't be fully answered in the way that we want to ask them, right? So that becomes important. Look at me, I'm all technical. <laughs> sorry, I'm cheesy, I know, I'm sorry. So content analysis is the study of records of human communications, which can be anything that has been recorded, such as videos, books, websites, TikToks, right? Laws, paintings, and even petroglyphs or rock carvings. A researcher conducting content analysis must use code or must code the information into a standardized, standardized form, such as searching or qualitative themes in the recordings or quant counting quantifiable data. So when mentors or instructors was timing how much of a TV news segment was spent on women's sports versus men's sports, she, this person was conducting a content analysis. They were also coding the quantifiable data. They were counting the, second, the seconds and recordings to of those to compare. Now, manifest content is the visibly surfaced content while latent content includes any underlying message meaning of the content. So regarding between the lines to find the patterns emerging. Think back to SOCH 101. Manifest is the intended function. Latent is the unintended function. Dysfunction is the problem, right? So you're using those same words again, right? Comes right back to the point of what we were talking about in the past. So it's important that we have certain processes, processes, and what have you. Now, a strength of content analysis and any unobtrusive research method is that a researcher seldomly has effect on any subject being studied. This method is also reliable and is easy to repeat any portion of the study. So if you miss something the first time, you can go back to get the content and look for more information, more information, which is very different from that of what a survey researcher can do with only one shot at collecting the information. Right, and I, you got one shot, will you miss it? It's that m, m moment, right? <laughs> Sorry, again, cheesy. Now, a couple of weaknesses of content analysis include that you are limited to examining record communication, right? Recorded in communication, which opens up a validity concerns, right? Is what is, what is, is written actually accurate? <laughs> and what might be missing from the record? Hmm, Alice Goffman, deep dive if you want. We are not able to know more about what isn't represented, which is huge, right? So there's plenty of reasons why this can be problematic, can be useful, right? When we're examining statistics, as I was just saying, we can use the main source of the data depending on the quality of the statistics, et cetera, et cetera, right? All these slides are posted, so always feel free to go back and use them. So now, a strength of content analysis and any obtrusive research method is that the researcher seldom has any effect on the subject being studied. This method is also reliable and easy to repeat, right? So you can go back, as we said, 
and uh, it, it becomes very interesting. So, and what might be missing from the record, we are not able to know, as I just said before. So there are strengths and weaknesses. It just depends how you look at them. Now, com now comparative and historical analysis is used to examine societies over time and in comparison to one another. This is similar in content analysis. The differences is difference here is that looking at historical comparisons and change over time. I allude back to my last lecture when I talked about that individual who was trying to say that race was used back in Julian Caesar's times, right? Well, it wasn't because we had to make sure that things change over time and wasn't misrepresented, right? It's a more specific type of analysis that looks at the archival data and primary sources. Doing research that does not directly impact participants can be quite useful. Yet, as always, our research questions and purposes should be the guidelines the methods we use to collect our data. This is very, very important. So looking at here at content analysis, the study of recorded human communications, code what has been recorded, right? Validity concerns, can we replicate more easily? Comparative and historical research. These are things we're talk about as always, these are posted. I go through them and I'm not always accurate on my slide switches, but the reality is, is that you'll have this information. Make sure you use it and make sure that you're paying attention to how we use these different types. Unobtrusive can be great. It's just a matter of circumstance of how we understand the data. And it becomes very important for us to know exactly what we're looking for. But as always, right, doing research that does not directly impact participants, as said, can be useful, but make sure that your research is being ethical. Our research questions and purposes should guide the method we use to collect our data. Point blank center, right? This is a quick lecture. I'll see you next lecture. And I hope you continue reading and you're enjoying what you're reading. And uh, yeah. Make sure you're staying on track. I'll see you next lecture.